of the authors of Guitar Players, a new book that's coming out um, in March, by, and it's been published by Hal Leonard. And it's basically the story of how Guitar Player Magazine got started for the first 20 years, correct? That's right. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the book? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Flip a coin and see what you want. Yeah. 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 How did you get started? And what? How did you get started with Guitar Player? Uh, back in 1970, I was out of work. I had been teaching and had a loyalty oath problem and I didn't agree with him. I quit teaching up in Idaho. So I moved, I'm from San Francisco, so I moved down to the Bay Area and I had a wife and two children, two daughters. This was one of them. And I had no job, no income, and I was really stuck for an hour. But I believed that if you did one thing a day toward a goal, you'd have 30 things a month. It wouldn't take too long for something to break. So it's one day, I bought a newspaper. I was living in this little town called Los Gatos, about 5,000 people. They had a little local paper. And there was an ad in there for a music magazine editor wanted. Son of a gun, I said. But I had no idea what kind of instruments this was for. Are places about players or what? I didn't know about those things. But it turned out it was for guitar players. I'm a drummer, but I played with a whole lot of bands and musicians, so I really knew guitar somewhere. And I went there and interviewed for this job. And the company was Bud Eastman who started it, his wife Maxine, who was assisting throughout, and a part time, half time woman who was answering the phones, and a half time kid who was going to college. So that was it. That was it. And so I went there, did the interview with, the, with this guy, Bud, wonderful, wonderful man. And he offered me the job. And I thought, terrific, I finally got a gig. Now, I had, my, broadca- my background had that time had been broadcasting. So I interviewed for, had, had already interviewed for a job producing local education uh, programming for a TV station in Sacramento. And the day that Bud Eastman offered me his job, I got this phone call from Sacramento offering a job producing educational TV. And I thought, oh man, what am I going to do? So I thought, Bud Eastman, I can believe this guy. I can really trust him. He's a good man. I'll go along with Bud Eastman and this thing called Guitar Player. A wonderful idea, except my first paycheck bounced. And I thought, oh, oh. what do I do? <laughs> However, Bud was such a gentleman about it, and he was so sincere in his belief that the world was ready for a magazine about any musical instrument, about guitars, what he knew. And so we came to an agreement that I would be the first full-time employee of this little company. And so from there, anyway, we started making changes and developing, direct, changing direction of things, and sort of fine-tuning the marketing of the magazine. and then. He had made it as a magazine for people who wanted to learn how to play. My background was a little different, so I changed it to make it a magazine for people who already knew how to play, but wanted to play better. And so that changed what we did in the way of columns, and, and we had in the advisory board, and it changed a bunch of things. And from there, you know, it took off. And that was all in print, because there was no internet back then. Oh, that's right. And we were doing layout, you know, with little hand waxers. Wow. And for about 10, first 10 years, I did all the paste stuff. And when we wanted a picture, you know, with a little border around it, I would take a, a felt tip pen and a ruler, and I would draw the border around it. And then I would take an exacto knife and cut that line in half. So it was a little fine line that went around the picture. But it was done with a, you know, a felt tip pen and exacto blade. Times have changed. Yeah, they certainly have. They certainly have. And how are you involved in the, in the uh, Well, I'm his daughter, and in the 70s and 80s when we used to play and hang out at the offices, it was a, it was a really wonderful time that I remember very well, and our family does, and people have come up to us over the decades letting us know how this impacted their lives in the music industry advertisers and players and the staff and he's approached still to this day people recognize him from then even though we sold the company in 1989 Um, so it just seemed like it mattered to people and 
and I wanted to help bring that to light, and I'm a writer too, I take after him, and that's why I just asked my father, I said, is it time, should we do this together? And he, he agreed, so I just got lucky. So we've been working together, um, finding the people that were on the cover or in the magazine, people who wrote for it, um, uh, photographers, staff, and, and it, it's been challenging finding the people, but when I have, they've been so optimistic and so positive about it. They want to participate and share their how it's influenced their lives. So. Okay, so I'm interested okay. about my her and my stepson over there, Devin. When about in maybe like 1980ish, we would have monthly jam sessions. Okay, all right. The magazine would go off to the printer. We'd all go down to the warehouse downstairs. We'd have beer and snacks and stuff. And I was hiring almost all musicians. That had to be the main criteria. Was I could teach them how to do like a piece of their life. I could teach them how to give a damn about music, and guitar, and stuff. So I hired them that in first. And so at the end of the month, anyway, we'd all celebrate. The magazines have all gone to the printer. We'd go downstairs and just like we have a jam session. And we had BB King came by twice and played with us. Uh, Chick Corea, Country oh. Joe McDonald, a whole Jerry bunch of different Garcia. people, Jerry Garcia, right? and Gara, Johnny and Winter. Devin, the little tiny kids. I was going to say, how old were you, Todd? How do you uh, add it? Well, <laughs> like starting off around age 10 and then through my high school years and into the beginning of my college age, so I'll be the teens and 20s. Now, do you play instruments? Nope, but I write. I, I guess you could say I play keys because I type up. Yeah. I'm very fast. Yeah. <laughs> that have said, I love, you know, I just love to do guitar, and I would just go try to buy every guitar magazine I could find, and just go through it, and go through it, and read it, and study it, and learn everything I possibly could, so, it, they have been very important to people's lives, and I still think front has a place, oh, yeah. you know. Because you can refer to it very easily, you go to your shelf and take up a magazine issue from three years ago, and you remember a, a lesson that was in there by somebody, and you just go right to it, lay it out, and there it is. Right. You have to fiddle with you know, going through all that. So yeah. did you ever think it would have grown to what it became? Uh, no, you know, I, never, I, did, I never really did. But also, I never cared, I never thought about what it could be in the future. The whole goal of the staff was to turn out the best possible guitar-related magazine you could people who were serious about the talk. We just sort of did it a month at a time. And the next thing you know, a couple of years went by, a couple of more years, people are calling up asking for back issues and so And then they never thought about it. They thought about it. This is going to be a start you know, magazine. We just wanted to be good. Right. And that's all any of us on the staff we started. I was the first one on employee as I mentioned. Uh, the third person in the company. When I left, we had uh, 128 people, oh, wow. and we had four monthly magazines, three newsletters, uh, a recording division, a special issues division, stuff like that. And we went from $40,000 a year to $15 million a year, and none of that was with the goal toward having a big successful financial or anything. We just, we do it better. Fortunately, doing it better seemed like a good idea. Was it, uh, so you started out basically as a, a, a magazine with, for, be, for cars, but it didn't have interviews in it, or did that come later? Uh, the early issues, as I said, were for magazine for people who wanted to know and learn how to play. Right. Uh, and there were columns in it. Uh, Easy Guitar was the name of one, and you know, how to play folk guitar. Created the magazine, and the first issue also had Jefferson Airplay included. Oh, okay. And went to uh, oh, the Big Magic Mountain events and had interviews with the guys in the doors. And Bud Eastman is no longer with us. He was basically a country metal steel player. But he was smart enough to know that that wasn't the extent of the world's interest in guitar. 
He had friends from West Paul, Jed Atkins. And he also brought in Dr. Jones and Fish and the Kirk Silver Messenger Service. We just took what he's, the foundation he's laid, expanded on it a little bit. <coughs> and, uh, and then added to it, brought in different kinds of advertisers, which just sort of broadened the whole base of the company. It worked out pretty well. Yeah, I'll say. So what, did you actually conduct some of the interviews yourself? Oh, yeah. What would you say would be like one of the most memorable ones? Oh, that's a really good question. On the one hand, you remember Mimi Farina? Mimi Farina? Farina? Joe Maez's sister? Yep. Uh, I interviewed her in about maybe 1982 or something like that. And I didn't expect a whole lot. We were there to interview Joan Baez, you know, the ticket name and all that. And Mimi was there, and she was with uh, her husband at that time, Tom Jans. And so I got a chance to sit down and meet, meet Mimi. How are you doing? Thank you. 